Welcome to this Information Services Today webinar on engaging information users. This webinar addresses content from Part 3, Information Services, specifically focusing on Chapters 14, 17, and 18. This webinar is part of a 10 webinar series representing the diverse authors and topics of the second edition of my book, Information Services Today, an introduction. As the editor, I am thrilled to be presenting this webinar series in conjunction with my textbook, Information Services Today, an introduction. Hearing directly from the contributing authors as they reflect and share their insight on today's information landscape is a unique opportunity to glean from their expertise, both the opportunities and challenges that lie on the horizon. In this article titled, why libraries matter more than ever in the age of Google, John Palfrey states that the library is an institution, the library is an institution has been fundamental to the success of our democracy. Libraries provide access to the skills and knowledge necessary to fulfill our roles as active citizens. Libraries also function as essential equalizing institutions in our society. Part three, information services, engaging, creating, and collaborating via technology, highlights the various roles, both in person and behind the scenes, that guide users through inf the information seeking process. The roles information professionals perform in providing information and technology literacy instruction is and to assist the user are also explored. In this webinar, we will we'll focus on three chapters. Chapter 14 explores user experience with an emphasis on how to design services, programs, and spaces to meet the needs of a variety of users. Chapter 17 focuses on the hyperlink library and the challenges and opportunities of an anywhere, anytime information access model. Chapter 18 introduces the concept of creation culture and maker spaces in information organizations and offers strategies for leveraging the desires of patrons and shared resources to engage users. Of tremendous value to this book are its contributing authors. These authors were specifically chosen for their expertise, passion, and commitment, not only to the field of information science, but also to, uh, also to the professional development of tomorrow's information leaders. I would like to now introduce the panel of authors for this webinar. Courtney McDonald, librarian and author of Putting the User First, defines user experience, explores user-centered design principles and excellence in practice, and highlights essential techniques for identifying, implementing, and assessing improvements in user experience, both for online and in-person experiences. Courtney is the author of Chapter 14, User Experience. Dr. Michael Stevens, author of The Heart of Librarianship and the popular Office Hours column for uh, Library Journal, emphasizes that the ability to share, collaborate, and reflect with information users while quickly responding to new technologies has become a necessary component of the information professional skill set. He is the author of Chapter 17 on hyper, the hyperlink libraries. Dr. Christian Fontecharo, coordinator of the University of Michigan's Mobile Makerspace Project, dives into maker programming, which brings together technologies of the past with innovative cutting edge technologies like artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things. She is the author of Chapter 18 on creation culture and maker spaces. Nice. There are six key themes for the second edition of Information Services Today in Introduction. Chapters 14, 17, and 18 address four of these themes. These chapters all provide a key overview of the state of the field, beginning with a history of the information organization and key influencers to forecasting future trends and issues that will require information professionals to remain forward thinking. They also address how libraries and information centers will remain valuable entities in their communities, but to thrive, they will need to remain creative, innovative, and technologically advanced. Additionally, they address new competencies, roles, and opportunities for information professionals. 
and they address challenges and key issues of the field and for the sustainability of, and essentialness of information organizations. So Courtney, Michael, and Kristen, what is your interpretation of these themes and how do they specifically relate to your chapter's content? Courtney, let's begin with you. Thanks, Sandy. Um, well, as I was thinking about these themes, especially in the context of user experience, um, one of the things that I think a lot about, um, I feel like the conversation about user experience has been one that has been growing in libraries and certainly in the general market. And it's a thing that we have really talked about mostly in terms of the web first, I think. It felt like a technology thing. But to me, um, we really try to focus a lot um, here and I try to focus on my own thinking about really thinking about the user and the experience and its sort of totality and understanding that, um, you know, I, I use the um, idea of a uh, sort of like a, uh, if you think about a film strip or something like that, you can see the story happen. You get these journey maps. People are coming and going through their lives. They're spending time in the library and the information organization, and then they're going on with the rest of their journeys. And so for that reason, um, most people that are not um, information professionals are spending most of their time in the sort of uh, general commercial web, the open web. It could be anything. So when I say in this slide that the commercial market tends to set the mental models and expectations for how things work on the web and in person, I'm talking about how much time and how many products do you use from Google? How often are you in Amazon? How often are you in Apple or any other one of sort of the tech giants that people are using just for their day-to-day -day life, their to-do lists and to connect with their family and wish them happy birthday and all of those things. It's, it's not necessarily a question of whether this is better or worse or, or setting us up as some sort of a... Um, in opposition to these uh, types of commercial entities, but just to know that that's, that becomes sort of the new normal for how people think about email or they think about communication or how a button should look or their phone behaves, right? Um, so all of those things I think are important for us to take into practice or into consideration in our own practice um, because our um, services, our information, our people, our collections are hugely important and um, and valuable to um, all the different patrons that we serve throughout the community. I think also um, one of the things that I see happening in terms of these themes and talking about the sort of global and diverse nature of today's information landscape, I feel like the sort of larger global perspective takes things up to a much larger scale than perhaps information professionals have been accustomed to having to think at, at all times. And certainly the, the question of user experience is one where I think you're always, in my mind, I'm always sort of switching between our very localized user experience of who are the people who are physically coming into you know, my uh, reference desk or whatever it is in this specific geographic location right here that are enrolled in this school, what have you, um, versus sort of like who are the ones maybe are part of my community but they might not come in and see me versus my potential um, group of users, which could be anyone all around the world, which I'm sure Michael will talk about when he talks about hyperlink libraries. We really, it's hard for us to tell now who our users are, so we have to be really thoughtful about what sort of characteristics and, and what our mission is as an organization. And then that kind of, I think, helps tell us what our, um, our theme should be. But when this happens in a global environment, you know, and you're switching back and forth between like, it's these people, it could be everyone, it could kind of make you feel like, ah, you know, how do you serve everyone? Um, my advice to you in the chapter is, is don't think about it as serving everyone everyone in that way of just sort of, you know, amorphous, you know, everyone to really start to engage with your community and find out what are those characteristics that um, of the things that they want to accomplish, the things you can help them with. And that will both enable you to be, um, you know, keyed into the sort of diverse characteristics while at the same time not having kind of in a vague anonymous sort of a user, right? Um, so I think the methods that we do are different, but obviously the types and, and values that we have of what we're doing these things for endure, and that's how I've kind of anchored my user experience work where things change kind of all the time. And then how do we, how do we engage with this in an environment where I think risk has not typically been part of the portfolio of something that information organizations have focused on. I mean, we talk about preservation of content and all these things. And so it can feel risky to think about how do we change all of our methods. Um, but I don't know that it has to be scary. I think it can be an opportunity. Thank you so much, Courtney. And so Michael, what are your thoughts? Well, I wanted to highlight uh, two of the, uh, the key themes. Uh, the first one is how libraries and information centers are going to remain viable. And I see three things happening here. I see uh, 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 an increase in the library uh, perceived as a community space. And here you're looking at the Doc One library in Aarhus, Denmark, where, uh, and this is a quote from one of the, the leaders of this library, we designed this brand new library, uh, we designed our library for people, not books. And that's really, that's kind of a statement that makes you think, 
but it, uh, uh, it might be a little rattling to, as well to librarians, but it really says that they designed this building for the community. The next area is the library as classroom, and that's within the library walls or virtually, there are opportunities of all kinds to learn, formal learning, informal learning, uh, via technology around the globe, connecting to other places, virtual field trips, as well as hands-on learning with all the different technologies that uh, we're reading about in the chapters and, and learning about as we, we look at creation culture and maker spaces, et cetera. Third, and because we talk so much about technology, I want to remind everyone that hyperlinks are people too. And having people come together and make connections can be so important. So let's switch a little bit from the viability of libraries to what roles we should play. And just very quickly, number one, I think we need to be curious as information professionals, curious about our users, curious about the world, and curious about technology. Second, uh, we need uh, to be as creative as possible, and that might be thinking outside of the box or, or uh, do, changing up services. And third, and this one's very important, and this is sort of the emotional heart of what I write about in the chapter, is that's empathy, and that's understanding where our users come from and putting ourselves in their shoes. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Michael. And uh, so now I'd like to turn it over to you, Kristen. So I want to draw on the big theme of community. Michael talked about it in terms of empathy. Um, I really want to talk about how excited I am about libraries and information centers, really focusing not on what outside institutions say is important, but on um, what our own community wants and needs are, given the huge diversity we have. Um, in this nation. If we look on the next slide, you'll see a little bit about some ideas that I think um, we want to pay attention to as we think about our libraries as situated in, within communities. When we talk about creation spaces or design labs or studios or maker spaces, and one is the reality that library maker spaces are evolving in ways that are distinct from other kinds of maker spaces distinct from the community model or the industrial model or even uh, K-12 maker spaces or higher education ones. And so it's important when we are engaging in this kind of work that we're really tuned into what does this community want and need? How is this community already served in those dimensions? Um, and that helps us avoid what I like to call the legend of the dusty 3D printer, which is we bought this thing because everybody said we needed one. But it turns out there's almost nobody in the community who uses or needs a 3D printer and they have their own. Um, really making sure that that sort of corner of shame that's in a workroom in every public library doesn't also contain choices that were maybe made um, with a little bit of poor skills. And knowing where there are opportunity gaps and where you can fill in. The other thing I think that's emerging as these um, progress is that we're seeing that there's some power in traditional practices that some people are looking for a break from technology. And so in some communities, those classic things like Michael showed in his video um, make a big difference. May, it looked like knitting in his group could be whittling. Um, I'm also noticing that a lot of the early rhetoric about, um, about entrepreneurship and career development in early makerspace discussion it's sort of gotten lost in the shuffle, and I want to suggest that that might be a place to revisit. You could tell we're very energy efficient here. And also this concern about beware the magical object, this idea that um, one, one special kit that we buy is going to by itself be transformative. So that's my thinking about the theme of community. Thank you so much, Kristen, and also Michael and Courtney. Uh, I was wanted to see if you um, some of the comments of um, that the other speakers maybe triggered some thoughts or ideas. Do you have any responses or things you'd like to contribute? I totally agree that that we're, we're sort of coming back around to that idea of the knitting group and the the more the the things that libraries have done so well for so long, and people maybe maybe looking for those things as a break from technology. It's a very good point. I would add on to that as well that I think for a little while we may have conflated um, it's sort of the danger of the shiny thing, which I think both Kristen and Michael have, have touched on, that we may have accidentally conflated technology or some 
some sort of mediated experience through technology for connection. And those are not the same things. And, and all information organizations are a place where people can come together and connect with each other. They can connect with um, materials. They connect with a 3D printer, whatever it is, it's meaningful. Um, but that there's all of these levels of that sort of tangibility versus sort of like the onlineness. And I think in order to be able to serve people in the way that they, um, you know, it's going to be the most meaningful to them, we have to think at all of those levels. And that's what I was sort of trying to touch on. We talk about user experience. It's like this online thing that's just out there. But when people come in your building, they're having a user experience with the chair that they're sitting in and with the lighting and with how quiet or loud it is and how they can make those choices. So I thought all of those points were, were really interesting that you made. Thank you. Yeah, and I love the idea of user experience porting itself out of just evaluating websites and apps and thinking about sort of the overall experience. If we're entering the experience economy, um, then the ways in which people interact, not just with our stuff, but with our staff, with our, with our building is so critical. Thank you so much. Those are really great points. So let's now move on to uh, direct our attention to today's information landscape. The first edition of this book came out three years ago. And as you know, the field of library and information science is in constant flux. So what are some of the key changes as they relate to your chapter's topic that have occurred since the first edition came out three years ago? Let's start with you, Courtney. Thanks, Sandy. Um, so a couple of these have actually come up in our conversation thus far. What I have seen is um, a noticeable increase in the interest in and attention to user experience in libraries. And as that interest and attention is increasing, um, we're also seeing the, the focus getting broader from being really a question of like um, usability, which is uh, a different sort of a question of whether something is usable per se, that rather than the sort of entirety of the user experience. Um, and that's something that I touch on in my chapter. But it, you know, if you uh, walk into your building as if you you've never been there before, um, I think you just really notice things in a really different way than um, you do when you just, you know, you drive the same way to work every day, you stop noticing a lot of things, you know, that it takes a lot for you to be like, oh my gosh, they painted that building blue. Well, people are having those experiences every single day in the buildings that we're in, as well as um, I think for our websites and our web applications. Um, and I think that that's one of the things I wanted to kind of allude to when we spoke before about the commercial models, these subtle changes in like where a search box works or how much information we have to ask people for versus says what they can sort of retain without having to retype it on a small thing. These are things I think that are valuable for us. The method of how they're getting to the information is really crucial for us to think about. And I think we can see this in the field. Um, there's more positions with phrases like user experience, administrative positions. I think going back to Michael's point about buildings, there's, I think I see a real start to shift in renovations um, as I observe and the types of buildings and what kinds of spaces we're building and how we're trying to think about them flexibly and not just as a giant container for inventory, which frankly, you know, I work in a building that is a, a, a giant cube. We call it the Triscuit in the sky because it was going to be a closed stack library. That's what it was for. It was for the books, not even for the people to be there. So it's been a challenge for us to think about how do we make that make sense. And then I think as many of us with older buildings get together, this community of practices building, and when there's conferences like Designing for Digital or journals, uh, the, you know, Weave, the Journal of Library User Experience, which is open access and I'm involved with that group, where we're trying to have these conversations with each other about what do these things mean and how do we engage. Thank you, Courtney. Michael, what are some of the things that you've seen? This is, this is so interesting to me to hear everybody coming together and, and how the, the themes are aligning so well. So the first thing I want to say uh, is when I, the chapter that I wrote for the first edition of the book was very much focused on technology and mobile technology. That has not gone away. And these things are still super important and it seems like everybody is carrying them around. But if we look at what's happening, uh, with the design of buildings and, for example, uh, the four spaces of the public library model that uh, the Doc One library is built on that emphasizes a space for experience, a space for user involvement, uh, a space where users feel empowered, and a space for innovation. Uh, it's fascinating to think that we're, we're sort of back to uh, 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 spaces and, as Courtney said, um, back to buildings and redesigning buildings that not only house our collections, but if we go a little bit farther, that we're, we are also providing uh, quiet areas for reflection. And I, I think the next slide has that. There it is. Uh, we're, uh, we're, we're sort of providing that balance for folks. <clears throat> 
And it's interesting to think about uh, libraries that have had adult story times where they, they just read uh, poetry and let people relax and reflect, or even meditation rooms. And finally, this is such an interesting example uh, I wrote about in the, uh, the, the first chapter, and it carries on uh, the first version of the chapter into the second edition, uh, spaces in libraries that encourage user creativity. This is a, a variation on the idea box. This is at uh, the St. Joseph County Public Library in South Bend, Indiana, where uh, people were saying what they were thankful for on little leaves that they could stick up on the wall. I'm thankful for new Weezer records, says that one. So uh, it's very interesting to think about how we might uh, inspire uh, folks' creativity as well. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Kristen, what about you? So I actually am a little more literal here than the other two have been because I'm really fascinated by how um, maker spaces and creation spaces are morphing as libraries adopt them. And so we're seeing a couple of national trends that really changed the way I thought about the chapter. And one is that the very earliest library-based maker spaces were designed to sort of be drop in any time. And what we're really seeing is activities now being put into the traditional programming calendar, which is a big shift. Um, one is that we're seeing in a lot of libraries that STEM work with youth is supplanting creation as a focus. Um, another trend was that um, a lot of early uh, library makerspace discussions talked about workforce preparation and talked about new careers or bringing back manufacturing. And what we're seeing is that the age range for a lot of maker activities are youth and teens. And of course, this is all against the backdrop that we expect anytime we change presidential administrations. Um, we've gone from an administration that was very passionate about making as a pathway to entrepreneurship and as a pathway to economic um, jump starting uh, into an administration that doesn't see that so much as the pathway. And so I'm really fascinated to watch how we're using the same words, makerspaces, design labs, used in such different ways. Thank you very much, Kristen, um, and um, to all of you for your thoughts. Um, I wanted to see if you had any comments on or any further observations that you wanted to contribute. I would just add quickly that um, I think it's interesting that you're talking about, um, you know, these very like drop in things and then having programming. We've been working with Makerspace in the context of a large public academic library. And I think what we're finding is people like to know the skills, but talking about that sort of like creativity and, and sort of thinking on one hand, how essential reflection is to creativity, but also the sense of play and lack of structure. And so what we've been discovering is the people who are attending many of our maker programs, that this is like a welcome antidote to the very extremely task-based relationship they have to the academic library the rest of the time. We are sort of the people that are involved in all of their deadlines and their papers, and so they're like, oh man. So we think, how can we make the academic library fun, right? Like, can you come and you can make a, a light up Valentine for yourself and learn some things about circuits, but also not work on your homework right now. And so it's been an interesting opportunity to, to play with this idea of creativity in an environment where mostly we've been interpreted as like the assignment people. <laughs> I think that raises a great point and we see a lot of when we work with communities and with students we see a lot of um, people who just need like downtime or processing time or to be off a schedule and I think we've really underestimated that in the literature. That's, you, that's a really uh, a, a good point. I, uh, I think it was uh, Madison Public Library in Wisconsin had uh, ambient music in a quiet, dark room for folks to relax and sort of clear their brains and things like that. I think that's so fascinating to think about. Wonderful. Thank you. So let's now direct our attention to the future. Uh, so what trends and emerging issues will impact the field of library and information science as it relates to your chapter's topic? Courtney? Thanks. So I'm going to actually jump down to the middle bullet point that I have here because I think it builds really well in what we were just talking about. And that um, goes to this question of um, really this trend I see for the makerspace, for analog, for human touch, authentic experiences. Everybody's tired of phone trees when you're trying to get help. They want to talk to a person. They want to have an actual experience. And technology is an isolating force. Um, there's been so much conversation and some research done on like social media stress, especially since the last election cycle 
people and people are starting to, I read some place and I can't cite it, so I'm being a, a terrible information professional right this minute, that a lot of um, millennials are starting to drop out of social media networks because they're just like, I can't cope with this, right? Um, it's just too much to be always on. When I first started thinking about the mobile web, which is the way I kind of got to the user experience by the side, always on kind of meant something different. I think now it was like an opportunity and sometimes I think like, oh, you can work from anywhere, sad face. Um, so I think this balance of being able to give people space, being able to be human with them and think like your experience is partially that you're probably just overburdened with everything in your mind. How do we create space for people to do those things? And then to jump back up to the top, I think, again, kind of to loop back to this bigger theme that I keep bringing up, as, um, as what's common on the commercial web, as the technologies change and how people are commonly interacting with things change, and you go to Medium and it tells you how many minutes it's going to take to read the article, those sorts of things, I think there's an increasing divergence of the library or information professional or information organization way, by which I mean all of these vended databases that have these interfaces that are what they are. Maybe they came from a, a print interface and then it just got put online and it may or may not connect to the intellectual content. So I think people notice these things more. It's not as easy to get eBooks in an academic environment. It is it is in a public library environment as it is as a private person. So there's going to be increasing, uh, I think, pressure on us to really start to engage with these questions and not make it feel so like a switch has been flipped and they're in like this other way of things being because we want them to have an authentic experience that does not bring them stress. And then we've talked about buildings. We've talked about some of the things. So I'll just, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you, Courtney. That's all great. Uh, let's turn it over to Michael. Wonderful. I want to uh, highlight that I think we're, we're getting sort of, uh, we're aligning so well is just the fact that the information landscape is rapidly, rapidly evolving uh, so quickly. And my, my little example, like for th at this absolute moment in time on the next slide is I added these virtual assistant things to my house and it has been so interesting to learn about them and see uh, studies so far, just little studies that have come out on how people use these things for information. For example, Alexa, turn off the office lights. Oh, she didn't do it. Oh, there they go. Yay, she turned off the lights. <laughs> what does this mean for the way that people use information? I can ask this device a question. It is fascinating to me. Please go to the next slide and we'll actually see the first hint of libraries being incorporated inside, and this is very specific to the Amazon uh, Alexa example, the Echo, uh, but there, there's a little bit of library presence. I think this is something kind of interesting to watch. And then to, to, to bring it back to the focus of the chapter in, in this last little bit I want to say is I really believe we are hurtling toward uh, the, the opportunity for us to, to learn from anyone in any, anywhere that is connected via all these devices and all of uh, all the technology. And again, to uh, to echo what Courtney said, is it, it it comes back to that idea of the human touch. And uh, in my chapter, in the definition of the hyperlink library, uh, the hyperlink library is human. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. And now to you, Kristen. So I want to build on Courtney's ideas about human touch and authentic experiences and really think about where we're going with creation culture and maker spaces. So first, I think there is a growing recognition that um, we may need to go move from this is fun and a fad to something that we, we think is important in our communities and how do we show that. And as we um, sort of double down, we may also have to ask ourselves, we're generalists, what do we do when we run out of STEM gadgets or our code lessons? Do we stay with librarians as generalists? Do we bring other folks in? And on the next slide, uh, we can actually skip forward to um, one of the big questions that I want to be asking is this question on um, what kinds of jobs are really going to be needed? Uh, is it true that coding is where we should be going with all of our makerspace stuff? There's a, I'm going to show you on the next slide. This is Bureau of Labor Statistics. And, um, this is their, the careers they think will have the most growth. And what is so fascinating to me is how few of these growth areas are currently being addressed in makerspaces and creation culture. About midway through, you see software developers, but there's a whole lot of healthcare jobs. And so I think that one of the interesting things will be, are we only going to funnel our work into creating one kind of um, worker, or are there new needs that are emerging? 
Thank you, Kristen. I think there is a really good synergy um, across the things that you're talking about. Uh, was there anything, uh, observations or any additional things you'd like to add to the conversation? Okay, well then let's move on to the next section. Um, and so we've addressed the changes of the past few years and the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. But at the core of the information landscape are the people who work in these organizations, just like we've been talking about some of the human element who are providing services to the communities that they serve. And that leads us to focus on today's information professional. So what advice do you have for the new information professional to meet the needs of tomorrow's information landscape? And based on your area of expertise, what are some of the key competencies information professionals will need to succeed in meeting the needs of the communities and organizations uh, that they serve? So Courtney, let's start with you. Thanks. Um, I actually, interestingly, kind of want to build on some of the things that Kristen and Michael were just talking about. And I think the most important thing that you can really do is try to learn the foundations. And by that, I mean, in terms of technology, not necessarily become a coder. You don't, and I, I really think a lot about the generalist versus the expert. This is a thing I think about like every day, right? So where is the place where you're, I often think of my expertise as being as being a generalist and as being able to make those referrals, we do a lot of bringing experts into our space and letting people kind of take it to the next level. But one of the things I'm observing is as we, as technology sort of becomes more abstracted and how these things happen, you don't necessarily have to understand what the Linux kernel is on your laptop for it to run, right? There was a time that this was knowledge that you needed. I'm not suggesting that we all go back to needing that knowledge, but I think there are some places where having a sense of how those things sketch together and sort of how the larger machine comes together will help you understand why we built a system the way we did at the time that we built it. And then that puts you, I think, in a position as an information professional to be able to ideate forward, to take into account the problems and the issues, the changes, and then to, um, you know, benefit maybe from the mistakes that were made in the first version of the system, which is something I think about with the technology systems that I use now. There's always a reason someone built it that way. And sometimes it was because of, uh, you know, limits of technology at the time. But to be able to understand sort of the underpinnings of that to some degree is useful. Being a keen observer, be willing to try things. Um, everything doesn't have to be permanent. And bringing your whole self to work. Um, I think being authentic and being able to really connect with people and being a representative of your community, sort of bringing your entire self is really so important. And I think just keep asking why and how. Um, so Simon Sinek has that uh, wonderful TED talk about start with why that he then has the book that comes from it. And really it, thinking about why we're doing what we're doing and, and being able to center in on those important key things, then we can sort of determine what are the meaningful hows for now, but we don't have to be defined by our how necessarily. We're defined by our why. I don't know if that makes sense, but I feel like this helps in an environment where it feels like things are changing so much. And How do you prepare? I think you just sort of have to, you get your boat as seaworthy as you can and you just plunge out and see what happens. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Nice. This is a, a passage uh, out, of the, out of the chapter where I sort of look back at what we just saw in, in my last slide about the global classroom, and I charge information professionals with constantly working to extend their knowledge and training by sharing, collaborate, collaborating, and reflecting uh, again with the global profession. And that means you know, looking outside of our organizations and even our national boundaries to, to look for inspiration and support. And on the next slide, this is one of the things that I charge my students with that is uh, fundamental to the chapter is that we should always, always be learning. And take a look at the next slide. Um, this is, uh, when I get to talk to rooms full of librarians, one of the last things I say is we should have this mindset of bring it on, you know, like, come on, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to see what the, this next technology is going to do or what this next, uh, cool thing we're doing with our building is going to do to, to uh, the profession, to information service, and to what it means uh, to be uh, in libraries uh, in the 21st century. And the last thing I will say is I believe the best librarians will be creative, fearless, and curious about everything. And that I'm just so thrilled at how this all aligns with what how the rest of you are saying. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, and great points. Um, okay, Kristen. 
So I'm going to just echo what Michael and Courtney have already said, um, which is that your MLIS or MSI or master's program is only the start of your lifetime of change and professional learning. And that being curious, as Michael said, and um, recognizing that you are entering an ever moving landscape um, is so important and that if you are on the fence about whether you like that, that's something to really think about. Um, it's always important to be monitoring local employment or education trends so that you can be as in sync as possible with what's going on and also identify those opportunity gaps. Keep those conversations going with community members. And then this is sort of the next slide is sort of the things that as librarians we don't like to do, but I think increasingly we have to do, which is continuing to think about um, how do we move from counting the number of bodies in the building or the number of items circulated to really thinking about impact? How is the community different? We instinctively know that we, um, that we make contributions, whether it's in a special library or in an academic library or a school or public library. We, I think, can do better at articulating that. And one of the things I think that's so important, as you'll see um, in, in the listing at the bottom of the slide, is how many resources exist across library types um, that can help us do that work better and start to see and compare strategies for what might work for us. And Courtney is saying in the chat something I think that needs to be said, which is be prepared to stop low impact items. And that is incredibly hard um, to do. So Courtney, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything more at this point to um, what you uh, were just chatting about. No, I, I thought that was a great point that, you know, they are the things that are, I think, scary and uncomfortable to do. Um, and then I think also, you know, what we are doing is important. And I think sometimes we become so immersed in sort of knowing, like knowing that that's important, um, that we forget that by, we don't have to prove it to people kind of in that way, but we can sort of continue to show that sort of thing. But that, you know, just because we have been doing something, it may be that, that the time for that is past and that we need to just let that go. It wasn't that it wasn't important at a time, um, but it is a, a thing that we need to let go to make room for new. Um, I was curious um, for the, the other speakers, if, if you've had experiences with people who are, um, like take something like Alexa, for example, and that makes them nervous about like, well, where are librarians? And or like, how do we cope with that sort of environment when somebody can just ask their personal assistant all of these questions? Do, what kind of answer do you give? Because I do get the answer, ask those questions and I, I think that it's a worthy question, but I, I don't have a great, I wonder what your answer would be. Uh, I actually, I just wrote a piece about this. Um, uh, on this topic, I, I really believe that ship has sailed. That the, these this is not going to go away. When I can ask my my device a question that I likened it to the 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 reference uh, scavenger hunts we had to do back when reference class was what reference class was. Um, that's not there anymore. But uh, I think we should find ways to to utilize the tech, to teach about the tech, to, in, to put ourselves in the tech, like the slide I showed with LA Public. Um, could we send out a story time that you can uh, make as part of your, uh, your flash briefing for your children or whatever it might be? Those are the things that I would focus on. The, I think that part of information service has sailed long ago with asking you know, sort of those, give me a recipe for this and tell me how tall Mount Rainier is type questions. Um, I'm going to answer sort of orthogonally or sort of indirectly, which is that I think that there are really big issues of artificial intelligence, which or AI and privacy that I don't think a lot of con uh, consumers have really been thinking about. I think we're seeing a change in late 2017, 2018. So I think too, how we help people be aware of the choices they're making, not to tell them that certain devices are good or bad, but to make them aware of how data points that used to be disconnected and sitting in different silos and different organizations can now come together. I think there's a real important consumer and data privacy piece there. That's fantastic, thanks so much. Thanks, Courtney, for asking that question. It's a really interesting question. I think there's a lot of changes in store, you know, to continue as this continues to evolve.
So I would like to thank uh, Courtney McDonald, Michael Stevens, and Kristen Fontacharo for joining us today in this webinar on engaging information users. I am grateful and honored for the insights and advice that you've shared in this webinar and for your contribution to information services today and introduction. To the listener, thank you for joining us. I hope you gained a deeper understanding of the changes, challenges, and opportunities within the field of information science. For more information, please check out the supplementary uh, materials available to you via the online supplements. Thank you again.